Welcome, and thank you for joining me for today's exploration of Hearst Castle, a remote old world manor. Looking at the overall estate, we see that this is something that defies simple explanation. We have an isolated, opulent manor. They don't even bother with any pretense on this particular structure. They just out and out call it a castle. And it's not too difficult to see why they call it a castle. What's the real story, though, behind this remarkable edifice in the isolated central coastal region of California? Well over a three-hour drive currently with modern roads, although, to be honest, it takes much longer than that. That's just straight-line distance if you're really cruising. Between Hearst Castle in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And imagine how long it would have taken to drive there back in 1919. And we'll talk about that. And it's not just the main edifice itself. There are several subsidiary structures on the estate that gives it a appearance of opulence and something that defies simple explanation, especially given the story that we have with its construction. And yet, Hearst Castle does have a little bit more of a, how shall we say, well-thought-out story. It makes sense. There could be some reality or some truth to the story of construction of this estate. Or is it simply something that's a little more well thought out, with a little more detail put into this? Is this a building that was built by our contemporary civilization? The efforts of a newspaper mogul and a brilliant genius architect? Or is this simply a story that was told for our entertainment, our amusement, and also to gain our understanding and acceptance of why this remarkable edifice continues to exist today in the middle of the central coastal region of California, not located near any major city or any area where it would actually make sense. And yet there it sits. Let's get an idea of where Hearst Castle is located exactly in the central California coast, as we're told. So here's the overall estate, and we'll go to map view. Hearst Castle is relatively isolated. It's about three miles from San Simeon. Typically you go to the little visitor center right here, and then they'll take you on a nice little bus up this very, very windy road, and that's how you get to the castle proper. However, when you zoom out, you see that San Simeon and the castle itself is a good 245 miles from Los Angeles and about 240 miles from San Francisco. So it's safe to say that you're very isolated out there in San Simeon. There's really nothing close by. That's the situation now. And imagine the situation in 1919 when construction began. Very, very isolated. California is a big place. How does an amazing castle end up on this plot of land in the middle of well, a very isolated area. Hearst Castle was formerly known as La Cuesta Encantada, Spanish for the Enchanted Hill. Isn't it interesting? We always have this enchanted, well-known-of hill in an isolated rural area. Reminds me of Holy Hill in Wisconsin. The only difference is there they say it was Jesuits or somebody in the distant past who discovered it. Interestingly enough, if they actually had the remnants of a Spanish mission of some sort on this hill, perhaps this story would make a little sense. Let's get into the story of Hearst Castle. And we see the incredible layout for Hearst Castle. We have Casa Grande with 38 bedrooms, Casa del Monte with 4 bedrooms, Casa del Mar with 8 bedrooms, and Casa del Sol with 8 bedrooms. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Neptune Pool, what a name. 345,000 gallons, and the Roman Indoor Pool with 205,000 gallons. Yes, with all those bedrooms, kind of gives you the impression that this isn't a house or a residence, but that this is some sort of resort or sanctuary, potentially. If this was a building from another civilization, what use could it have had? Well, given its relative isolation, we can speculate that perhaps this was some sort of sanctuary especially if we had a reset that was very tumultuous. Regardless, we're going to look at the official story that this was a residence, an estate that was built all to fuel the ego of this individual, William Randolph Hearst. Born in 1863, an individual who would rise through the success of his family, the Hearst family, to inherit a media empire. And that's what he'd run throughout the 20th century. 
1919, he inherited a great deal of money and land that his family had gone camping on when he grew up. And he decided that he was going to build his incredible, amazing, enchanted palace on this plot of land, this hill that we talked about. He couldn't do this alone. He needed a great, incredible genius architect, and he hired the services of Julia Morgan, 47-year-old, one of the pioneering women architects in the United States, brilliant and a genius herself. She had 700, billion, 700 buildings to her credit, and this would be her most encompassing and well-known project. We'll talk about some of the exploits of Julia Morgan, and yet Julia Morgan had a very interesting personality. She was stated to be a recluse and had some introverted tendencies, yet somehow she formed the perfect team with William Randolph Hearst. Quite an interesting story and quite an interesting combination of personalities. It's here, though, we have to consider the fact that uh, they started building this property in 1919, and we're told that the Hearst family moved in in 1925, so only six years. Now, we do have accounts that some of the structures were brand new, and they try to go to great lengths to convince us that that's the fact. We're also told that uh, Julia Morgan was so brilliant that since this was very isolated, and the official account does talk about how difficult it was just for her to get there from her San Francisco office, how far she had to travel, and also the difficulty in recruiting and retaining a labor force. I guess all those traveling laborers weren't around in the 1920s anymore. Perhaps they'd all found jobs. In any event, uh, Julia Morgan, who, quite frankly, you must classify as a genius, regardless of whether you go with the official account that she had architected this house and overcome all these obstacles, or if she just played a role very, very well. I don't know, and I'm merely suggesting that there could be an alternative explanation, especially when you look at the opulence, the beauty, and the detail that goes into this incredible structure. So the Casa Grande, or Hearst Castle itself, one of the exploits of Julia Morgan is that she managed to sort out the difficulty in bringing water to the site. The nearest water was seven miles away, and she had apparently designed a gravity-driven reservoir all by herself, and we don't exactly know who built it, it's not stated, to provide water because they needed water for the labor force, and they also needed water to make this incredible concrete that they used. In any event, when you look at the structure, you see its ornate detail, and of course we'll be told this is Spanish colonial revival, although we have other architectural styles that go into this. So, not only was Julia Morgan uh, very brilliantly well trained, and we're told that she was, we also find out that she managed to create an amalgamation of various architectural styles in Hearst Castle, which is why at the start I posed the term amalgamation revival style. But look at the detail around the door and the walls. It is definitely something incredible to behold. And we also have to consider the challenges of building this. Now, they try to obfuscate this a little bit by saying they started building this in 1919. And William Randolph Hearst and Julia Morgan worked on this for 28 years until 1947. And then finally, with his financial fortunes changing, they couldn't continue to construct it. Yet, we're also told that the Hearst family moved in in 1925. Look at the beauty on this tower, though. And while you could say this is Spanish colonial revival style, or whatever style you want to call it, you also get the hint that there's some other kind of style in it. I don't know, what do you think in the comments? How does the detail and the decoration on these towers incite you to feel? And, to be honest, it is in a beautiful area on a beautiful hill. And well, where would we be without wondrous, beautiful fountains to provide great water with steps and handrails and beautiful light posts? Yes, yeah, so all this on this isolated property out in the middle of a remote area in central coastal California. Not exactly what you'd expect to see. And probably not something that's easy to explain if someone were to just simply come across this structure. However, we're going with the mainstream narrative that this was all the work of William Randolph Hearst and Julia Morgan and the various labor forces that they had out there and the various contractors that she worked with. There's even stories that they had built their own hydroelectric plant to provide power until they were put on city power a couple years into their residence there. Ah, yes, Neptune Pool. Very beautiful and gorgeous, and here's where we have our Roman Greco revival style. And, you know, it's the Piedmont or the triangular formation that we often see with the beautiful columns. 
you just can't help but be overwhelmed by the sheer beauty and the striking visual depiction that you have, even in the image. Now, I was at Hearst Castle about 10 years ago, and I remember how beautiful it was, and considering the fact that, well, it's over 100 years old now, and it was approaching 100 years old when I was there, I was amazed at how pristine that it looked. And yet, there were signs that some of these structures were much older. And of course, you have all these beautiful ornate statues. And then of course, you look and, and again, we see these statues that are fine carved. So difficult in bringing all these logistics and all these workers out here. And yet, they managed to achieve this. And of course, it's somewhat hidden in the historical narrative that it took them so long. But then, conversely, we're told the family moved out there right away. Now, how long do you think it would take modern contractors with an architect, although I don't know if we could find an architect that would match the genius intellect level of Julia Morgan, to really pull something like this off now? And I'm sure there's those of you out there that'll believe, yes, we could do this. We just need to throw enough money and enough effort at it, and we can pretty much do anything. But I really wonder... There's also something else interesting when you consider the Neptune pool here, and you see the architecture and the layout from a different perspective. We have to consider the fact that this was built in 1919 through 1947, although let's be honest, we have a lot of inclinations that it was already built, and this is a scene from the movie Spartacus with Crassus, the main antagonist, played by Sir Laurence Olivier. Isn't it intriguing that in 1960, they decided to film a film on location at Hearst Castle, which doubled for Crassus's Roman villa. And you can see why it would be quite convincing. And if you go back and you watch the movie, yes, this was filmed at Hearst Castle. Now let's take a look at the interior. Yes, I'm sure they were still working on the fine carving and detail of that ceiling, even after the family moved in in 1925. Now, this is part of the library that you're looking at here. And it's always more of a story when you look on the inside of a building and you see these incredible details. And, you know, I could just see uh, Julia Morgan there personally supervising the work crews as they carved all of that in, in the ceiling. And who knows, maybe uh, William Randolph Hearst was down there below reading a book and he was getting a little annoyed as little pieces of wood shavings and splinters hit him as he was reading his book. But again, this is just something that you have to question. I mean, even 28 years to put all this detail in this structure. And when you go and you tour the Hearst Castle, or manor, or palace, or whatever you want to call it, you're constantly overwhelmed by the sheer amount of detail that you see in every room. And keep in mind, this is still standing. It's still there near San Simeon, California. And you can go visit it. And you can tour it, and you can see the beauty and the opulence in every single room. And I was starting to get different eyes when I went here the first time. But I still recall thinking it just wasn't easily explained. It didn't make any sense. How much effort would it have really taken to achieve all of this? And of course, we're given the explanation that William Randolph Hearst was a person who was very profligate. He was someone who would spend vast amounts of money, and there was even a film made about him called Citizen Kane, and they considered it a satire in 1941. Yes, yeah, a satire. Oh, here we are, another sitting room with the amazing, beautiful, well-decorated fireplace. And again, another very detailed and ornate ceiling, and as you can see, no detail spared. And look at the beautiful floor, too. As though they had nothing but infinite time, infinite resources, and infinite resolve on their hands. Or again, we just attribute it to the genius of Julia Morgan. There was just nothing she couldn't pull off. They say this was uh, William Randolph Hearst's bedroom. Isn't this a contrast, this individual with this very extreme personality to indulge in such opulence and expenditures and you know if you look up the word profligacy in the dictionary supposedly you'll see his picture because they associate him as a profligate regardless this was his modest bedroom although you see the ceiling and the window dressings and the detail it's not very modest and of course his uh, billiards and pool room 
Yes, I would love to have a billiards and pool room like this, and where would it be without our incredible fireplace with what looks to be the big angel on it? And of course, we have detail in the ceiling here as well. And look even at the doorway and the detail over the doorway. And remember, we're very isolated here. Isolated in remote California, and yet you can put in a fireplace like this with this kind of detail on it back in 1919 and 1930. Or maybe they'll say this one took a little longer. They're still working on that fireplace. Uh, well, and you know, the other the other part of the story is during World War II, they stopped working on the castle because supposedly they were in danger from a possible Japanese invasion. At least that's what they said. And here's that ceiling, and, and just look at the detail there. This is just the billiards and pool room. That's all this is. And you can see it in the light fixtures and everything else. And of course all the tiles, and there's even accounts of how Julia Morgan worked with various contractors to get the right tiles and everything else. I mean, it's really incredible. And here's another one of the remarkable sitting rooms, although maybe I would just go ahead and upgrade this to Extraordinary, or Beyond Description. Look at the detail in the ceiling here. And you thought you saw detail in other ceilings that we've looked at. And yet here we have fine carving, shaping, however they did this. And yet incredible works of art. Now we're told that William Randolph Hearst was a very astutious art collector. And then we go to uh, another one of the very beautiful sitting rooms, or whatever you want to call it, grand halls. You could have any number of names for this. And here, of course, we have another fireplace. We have great detail in the floor. And you also see up in the walls there, it's as though they just couldn't stuff enough detail into this. And look at the fireplace. The detail in the shape of the fireplace, and then you know what you'll be told are carvings or whatever else. How exactly did they do that? It's a good question. And as you start to see the interior of this incredible castle, how do you think this was all done? This is definitely a story we have to question, even though it seems as though they put a little bit more thought into it. And yet everywhere you look, anywhere you go in Hearst Castle, you see more and more of this. And it gets more complicated and more ornate as you continue to progress within the castle. The layout of it's also somewhat difficult to describe as well. And about the best way you can see it is to actually go on the tour. And you find yourself almost as though you're lost within the structure. Now you're not really lost, but you just sort of have that feeling. There's almost something ethereal about being within the structure, as though it gives you a completely different feeling. Perhaps it's just my perception because it's hard to explain all these incredible sights that you see and all this immense beauty loaded within every room in every single detail on the walls, the ceilings, the floor, and here the dining room. Yes, yeah, say. Very modest dining room, as you can see. You know, you can imagine all the scenes from many different movies that they could film and use this dining room for. Although, maybe they couldn't explain it because the other interesting thing to me is the unique mixture of styles or the amalgamation you see of styles here. But here you go, another fireplace and the doorways with the beautiful detail on them. And remember, this is very isolated. We can't let that simple fact escape us. Was this simple genius and resolve and just hard work for years and William Randolph Hearst's infinite resources, which did eventually dry up. He did run into financial problems in the Great Depression, as many others did, and didn't do so well when he decided to supposedly take a stand against uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Here we go with more ceiling detail. It's just very, very difficult to easily describe. And yet, just looking inside a few of these rooms, you have to wonder how much detail and work would have gone into this. And now we go into the indoor Roman pool. And here we see another example of incredible beauty that defies simple explanation. How much effort actually went into creating this pool? And how easy was it for the workers or the contractors at that time to execute and carry this out? Look at some of the arches and the pillars and the support structure of this pool. To say nothing of its 
innate beauty with these lights and the reflections. This definitely gives you the feeling of being in some sort of science fiction fantasy land, and perhaps this location more so than any other. And now we look at some of our supposed construction photos of the outdoor pool, or the Neptune pool. Very convincing right here, isn't it? And you'll find the construction photos are rather lacking for Hearst Castle. So I don't know, perhaps uh, William Randolph Hearst didn't want it that well documented, or maybe there were other things going on. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, and we're going with the mainstream account here on how the house or castle was actually built. Strange photos, and here are the Casa Grande, and this is a very strange one. There's something that looks very off about this photo, and I don't want to bias your opinions, but it's just hard not to say it, especially when you look and you see the previous photos of the Casa Grande, or the main structure of Hearst Castle, and you look at this photo, and you see something that just doesn't seem to match up. And of course, when you go on site and you really look at Hearst Castle, and you're able to interact with it, you see its reality. And here's William Randolph Hearst himself with uh, some of the leading financiers at the time, late 1920s, early 1930s. Strangely enough, when uh, William Randolph Hearst ran into financial problems, it seemed like no one was there to cover for him or to help him out. He was therefore unable to continue his vanity project at Hearst Castle in 1947 and had to relocate to, well, I would presume, less presumptuous quarters for himself. He'd had a lot of family problems, and the actual person who helped him facilitate hosting at Hearst Castle was Marion Davies, his mistress. And we go back to the movie Citizen Kane, which was made about William Randolph Hearst by the aforementioned Orson Welles, who has appeared on this channel before in War of the Worlds because of his radio broadcast. This came out in 1941 and was considered a satirical picture on William Randolph Hearst. And official accounts tells us that he tried to suppress this film. Interestingly enough, there is an analog to Hearst Castle called Xanadu in the film. And they even say the very stones of many another palace. And this is a satire. You have to wonder if Orson Welles was being on the nose or if he's throwing us a hint, saying that Hearst Castle was really from something else. It was another palace, and he simply claimed it. And there's Orson Welles, and you know, many people consider Citizen Kane the finest movie ever made. It's a very interesting movie, and I certainly recommend if you get the chance to watch it. I wonder if they're ever going to make a bio of Orson Welles, because if they do, I think they could get actor Jonathan Frakes, also known as Commander William Riker, to play Orson Welles, as in his later years he bears a very striking resemblance to Orson Welles. And I have to admit, in the original days of watching Star Trek The Next Generation, I never thought that I'd see the day where Commander Riker resembled Orson Welles. Let's take a quick look at the Hearst Building in San Francisco as it still stands there today and see what it looks like. Oh, good old San Francisco. It's been a while since I've been there. I think the last time I was on the ground was in 2006. And there it is, the Hearst Building. Let's uh, drop the man and take a look. Mm, lots of old world buildings in San Francisco. Don't worry, we'll be getting to an exploration of this. Ah, yes, and here is the Hearst Building. And let's look at the front facade that Julia Morgan worked her magic on. Very beautiful, very pretty. And the building's been there a long time. Wait a minute. What's this over here? Why does this building look familiar? Uh-huh. I've seen this building somewhere before. But where? Ah, yes. Now I remember. From the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. This is the Call Building, completed in 1898 in San Francisco. And this is what it originally looked like, and we see a very beautiful building with all of the architectural prowess and construction prowess that we had in 1898. Now, will you see a building like this built today? No, you will not. But you can see what happens when a building like this supposedly survives the San Francisco fire, and then it is transformed into the very beautiful and ornate central tower that it is now, insert sarcasm. 
How can you do that to a building? What a bunch of... Shall we move on? In any event, I can't stand to really look at this building. It's just a tragedy what happened to it. But we'll be getting to an exploration of San Francisco and we'll discuss it. In closing about the Hearst Castle, what do you think? Do you believe that this is a amazing vanity project of William Randolph Hearst that was facilitated and carried out by the architectural and just simple plain genius of Julia Morgan? Or was this a structure that was from a previous civilization? Was this some sort of refuge or resort or a building with some other purpose? Let me know in the comments what you think it is. That managed to survive. And they simply had to contrive this story because William Randolph Hearst, in addition to being a media mogul, was also a politician. He was elected twice to the House of Representatives as a Democrat and ran unsuccessfully for Governor of New York and for President of the United States. What do you think about this story? How do you think this stacks up with what we're told? Or was it just something that was contrived to give us an explanation and to explain the presence of this building? Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Thank you for joining me today. Please like, comment, and subscribe.